Thank you all for coming. I'm Richard Watts, the director of the Center for Research on Vermont. Can you guys hear okay in the back? We have, okay. So let me know if you can or can't. Um, uh, just a few words about the Center for Research on Vermont, and then we're going to turn it over to our featured program tonight. So welcome to the first seminar in our Research in Progress seminar series of the spring. The Center for Research on Vermont was founded in 1975, and we have done hundreds and hundreds of these Research in Progress seminars over the years. This year, we inaugurated the Frank M. Bryan Vermont Scholar Summer Research Award to fund a Vermont researcher, not just UVM, a Vermont researcher to do summer research that adds value to our understanding of Vermont. And the first award went to Dr. Teresa Mares, who's an anthropologist here at UVM, and her research is related to migrant workers on Vermont's dairy farms. And you can read more about what she's proposing to do and her commitment as an anthropologist to study Vermont on our website. Um, as well as other information about center awards, new awards for students doing research in Vermont during the summer. and. Uh, for scholars writing books on Vermont. But given Frank's Brian, the retired political science professor's scholarly work on town meeting and democracy, and given that next week is town meeting, we thought that we would follow the thread of what Frank Bryan has written about related to the scale of Vermont and Vermont's civic culture in this seminar series this spring. So Frank Bryan has written and argued, and on our website is a blog uh, where he talks about why Vermont research is important and what it is about Vermont's scale and civic traditions that maybe make Vermont different from other places. And he says, Frank argues, the truths of the universe that we all need to know to make the world a better place are operating right here in Vermont because we're a small scale, civic, open society. So that's why the theme, or that's a way to think about the theme of the spring seminar series. Is there something about Vermont that's different? So tonight we'll hear from Dr. Fox on some of the work that's happening around the criminal justice and community justice systems. Next week we'll talk about, next week, March 25th, how people get around in Vermont. April 15th, a scholar here who's done work on using medical databases to make big statements about health care. And then we'll finish all this on May 7th with um, some Vermont scholars who are editing a book called The Vermont Difference, which has 18 chapters on various aspects of Vermont that they argue are significant to Vermont, but also to the broader world. And um, there's an annual dinner that you're all welcome to come, just RSVP to me. And that's on May 7th. So those are all things to come. Hence our seminar series, The Vermont Difference. And hence, go to our website if you have any, if you want any more information on any of the work that we're doing this spring. Welcome all. And by the way, there's refreshments in the back. So a couple last things, and then I'm going to turn it over to Commissioner Polito, who's going to introduce Dr. Fox. Mm -hmm. This is a sign-up list to get added to our events for the spring. I'd ask everybody to consider putting your name on this. We'll just keep you informed about what we're up to. And uh, there's a pen attached. 
And as we think about what seminar series to do in the future, I'd love to hear your thoughts or what research you think we should highlight. So, tonight, <laughs> um, I do want to thank the Department of Sociology, Tom Streeter, the chairs over here, Gail Burford from the College of Education and Social Services Department, Gail, thank you for their support for this, and the De Community Justice Consortium. Recognize Margaret Tamalonis, who's the chair of the Center for Research on Vermont somewhere here. Hi, Margaret. And now, what I'd like to do is introduce the, the commissioner of the Vermont Department of Corrections, Andy Polito. Andy is going to introduce Dr. Fox and say a few words about her research. And, and Andy joined the Vermont Department of Corrections in January of 2001. He has a special guest with him tonight. <laughs> and he's worked nearly nine years in other parts of Vermont state government, began his public service career with the department's parent organization, the Agency of Human Services, in 1992. Thank you, Commissioner Polito. So I'm going to apologize right out of the gate. I am a notorious soft talker, which kind of conflicts with my day job. And I've been testifying almost all day today, so I'm uh, about at the end of my voice. The special guest I have with me is my daughter, Sarah. And even though I knew coming here, and I accepted uh, Dr. Watts's is it better? invitation to do this quickly, because I really wanted to do it. And I knew it was going to cost me a small fortune between dinner and some money. I knew that was all part of the gig and showing up at college to see your daughter. I wanted to do this because it's really important. The department started, uh, I'll back up a little bit. The Department of Corrections in Vermont is a, is a different breed than in other states. And the reason it's different is because it's completely integrated. And so from the time that you are engaged by law enforcement to the time you're done with your parole sentence, which is the farthest out it could be, or other sentence, you're under one Department of Corrections and under one Commissioner of Corrections. If you go across the state, the states, it's much different than that. It's, it's very fragmented. And you could touch, uh, you know, three or four or even five different departments, county level, state level departments, all along the way in your journey to serving your sentence. And it can be a little bit overwhelming. The other benefit is if you want to set criminal justice policy at a state level and see how it works. You could do it in Vermont. It's a controlled population. We have a very uh, stratified criminal population. So we see people who are detained on disorderly conduct all the way to the case that we have in Rutland, for instance, which is an outlier case. So our levels of violence are low, but we still have a very stratified uh, population. And one of the things that we strive to do in corrections is really have some kind of evidence that what we say we're going to do is working. So people are always going to feel unsafe no matter what we do. They're going to be affected by the media or the TV shows or, frankly, Americans' thirst for violence, which I think is well documented. But when we start a program, we have to be able to show that what we said we're going to do, what we set out to do, in this case, what we got federal money to do, I testified in front of U.S. Congress on this thing, um, is working. And so UVM is a natural partnership for us. And it's a, it, it allows us to go back and say, here's what we said we were going to do, and here's the evidence that we did it. And I don't know if you caught um, Dr. Fox's presentation on VPR about a month ago, but it was much better than I could have said it. Because when I go out and say stuff, it's, you know, here's another one of the governor's guys, and they're talking about it. But when you have a UVM professor and somebody with Dr. Fox's criteria, I think it's, it really adds a level of expectation that we're, we are we're um, producing what we say we're going to do. And so it's my honor to, to uh, introduce Dr. Fox and thank you publicly for all the work that you do and the entire university going back to uh, Dr. Burford's work back when I first joined the department. Um, he was kind of a rock star at UVM, you know, he, he kind of showed up at meetings and it created this kind of really strong partnership between DOC and UVM, and so I'm, I'm really thankful and indebted for what you've done, and so I'll turn it over to you. All right. Well, thank you um, to the 
uh, Center for Research on Vermont and to Commissioner Polito for that introduction. And I also want to thank my home department, Sociology, which is a uh, very uh, welcome home for me. Am I? Is my mic? Talk closer to this. Oh, I'm supposed to have a mic on. Oh, okay. This so this is a different one. Okay, sorry. I'll try, but I do wander, so I'll I'll try to stay in front of it. But, um, and I also want to thank other people in the Department of Corrections, especially my colleague um, Derek Miodovnik, who has been a, a very forward-thinking uh, in terms of the innovations that they've tried at Corrections, and also just uh, John Perry and John Gorchik and Dave Peebles always. Uh, tolerate my enthusiasms, as does uh, Commissioner Polito. Um, but I mostly want to have a shout out to the reentry coordinators and the community justice directors, the volunteers, and the formerly incarcerated individuals who are the people actually doing the hard work of reintegrating on the ground. Um, so I realize that I have a diverse audience tonight, some academics, some community members, and I will do my best to speak to all audiences, but uh, bear with me if I don't. Um, where did my, okay. <laughs> so uh, first tonight, I want to begin by explaining the context in which reintegration programs emerged. Then I'll talk specifically about the Vermont approach, including the specific program that I've been studying, which is called Circles of Support and Accountability. So if you hear me refer to it as COSA, that's what it means, and I'll explain what that is. Um, and then for the academic portion of the show, I will explain the criminological literature on desistance and, and try to describe how I think COSA fits into that and um, how it actually has the potential to advance our thinking about uh, desistance from crime, which means you know quitting crime, stopping crime. And then I'll return to talk about the Vermont context and my next steps in going forward with this project. And hopefully we'll have questions at the end. So just briefly, a lot of you probably know this, but for those of you that don't, um, I think the context is important to understand. The US for about the last 30 or 40 years has undertaken a grand social experiment um, in mass, what's called mass incarceration, which has been a bunch of different things, but longer sentences, lowering the bar for which crimes would receive a prison sentence, um, tremendous collateral consequences on the other end of a prison sentence. I understand they were talking about that today at the, at the State House. Um, and uh, at, at, uh, we have the highest incarceration rate in the world. And this comes at a great cost to citizens and um, budgets, actually. And you know, it's nearly bankrupted the state of California, if you know anything about that. It's also led to tremendous overcrowding and a serious crisis in corrections departments all around the country. Um, so most states chose to build more prisons. And uh, therefore, they had to shift the funds from things like rehabilitation to you know, bricks and mortar construction and staffing, um, and you know, sort of gave up on rehabilitation. But Vermont chose a different path. Uh, Vermont decided to distinguish early on between the less serious offenses that could be managed at the community level, the lower, uh, lower level offenses, and then the more serious ones that needed targeted treatment, evidence-based treatment. And one thing I will say about the Department of Corrections in Vermont is they're very uh, research-based, evidence-based, and it, you know, they try different things um, and they create their own research as well, but they, they do try these innovative programs. So the thing that they did that they are the most well known for around the country is um, incorporating the principles of restorative justice, uh, which if you don't know what that is, it's an alternative model of justice um, that tries to address mostly victims' needs, also community concerns, and um, you know, repair the harm that's done to all in, in the uh, commission of a crime. So they've also at the same time focused on gradually rele releasing people back into the community. Um, and so they were doing reentry well before any other state even was really talking about it. And in fact, when I go to criminology conferences and I talk about what we're doing in Vermont, they always say, oh, well, that's Vermont. No state is as forward thinking as Vermont. And so you know, we're considered an outlier. And they also say uh, that um, um, I'm lucky to live here, so, which I agree. Um, so um, 
Vermont decided that crime is a community level problem that is best addressed by local communities when possible. So in doing so, the state devolves some of its control to the local level, and it did so by creating a community justice infrastructure. And uh, I know I see lots of people here that are from community justice centers, and um, it, Vermont is still the only state in the union that has a statewide uh, infrastructure like this. And I, originally when I first learned about it, I don't think I understood how profound it was until I saw the kinds of things that they're able to do that they have difficulty doing in other places. So, um, so um, let's see. All right, well, because of the mass incarceration experiment that's happened, um, and the fact that Vermont, I'm not sorry, not Vermont, the U.S. has high reoffense rates, um, which actually increased after all our get tough policies, by the way, and the fact that 95% of prisoners are eventually released, uh, the federal government finally, I would say slowly, um, it learned and realized that they were going to need to start paying attention to some of the issues that are associated with releasing offenders. So uh, there are 650,000 people released from prison in the United States every year. And uh, often they, are, they leave in much worse shape than when they went in. And they face tremendous obstacles that a lot of people don't realize. Uh, one is getting suitable housing, finding decent employment, and especially with certain um, collateral consequences and, and the stigma that they face, it's difficult to get a lot of different kinds of employment, um, access to substance abuse treatment, education, and most important for our purposes today is um, the, the, they lack social support, and a lot of people are isolated after prison um, in part because of the stigma. So the attention that to reentry issues that the federal government started paying in the early 2000s, I think is important because it represents a more sociological understanding or social understanding of the issues that released prisoners face. Uh, whereas before that time, there were, uh, you know, there was treatment in prison and there was a uh, belief that if you just open the doors, then they'd be fine because they were treated in prison, not realizing that there were all these uh, really sociological problems and issues that they faced. So what happened is all states received um, federal funding to develop reentry programs, which were designed to try to ease the transition and it, specifically because of the recidivism rate is so high, the revolving door to prison that you've heard about. Um, and so most corrections departments, what they did was either decide to run the reentry programs themselves or just augment their own services. So a caseworker inside a facility would start doing some reentry planning. But one of the dilemmas that they've had is, you know, it, it, it's not that easy for a state corrections department to run them themselves because they are an organization of social control. And also, the other option is to look around for nonprofits that exist and try to find one that fits that would, that would be a good match. And Vermont didn't have to do that because state corrections had already developed a relationship with municipalities so that uh, they both fund the community justice centers. So they operate in between those levels of government somewhat autonomously and they had, they've been running reparative boards for uh, two decades or something, a really long time, and then they were just a natural fit to run the reentry programs because they already had the community capacity built for, um, in the form of volunteers. And other states have not had it that easily, and I will tell you that this COSA program that I'm going to talk about is most developed in Vermont. Um, it has been uh, shown to have the highest fidelity to program fidelity of any of the programs that are operating, and really there are not very many that are operating anyway. So um, the, the other interesting thing about the COSA model, which I think speaks to the fact that it is not a top-down sort of process, is that the idea for the COSA came from community justice directors who went and got training on it and brought the idea back. So, uh, you know, it's a community community spawned idea. So they settled on this model, which is called the COSA model. Um, in the 1990s in Canada, the program was developed and it was specifically for high risk sex offenders who uh, had maxed out their sentence and communities were nervous about them being released. So a Mennonite pastor uh, developed a program which would be a circle of support around the person. So it would provide both support so that he could transition back to the community and also 
hold them accountable, accountable so the communities would feel safer. Um, and the motto of it is uh, no more victims no, and no one is disposable. So it, it, that it really embodies the ideas of support and accountability. Um, research out of Canada shows that it can reduce recidivism by somewhere between 70 and 80 percent depending on the study, which if you know anything about correctional treatment or anything like that, those, those are incredible numbers. Most treatment doesn't um, even approach that. Um, and th th those were in randomized trials that happen. And in Minnesota, the only place in the United States that's done recidivism studies on it, uh, they determined that for every dollar spent, there's a dollar 82 uh, that you get in terms of um, benefit. So there's no doubt that it works, um, at least based on the existing research. So what COSA is, is there's a core member, that's the released prisoner, the formerly incarcerated individual who is considered uh, medium or high risk be, in part because of his or her isolation, um, lack of social supports. There are uh, usually three to four trained volunteers from the community, well-trained volunteers, and then a re-entry coordinator that is um, a paid employee of the um, community Justice Center and they navigate with corrections, the probation officer, and sort of provide ongoing uh, um, support for the team. And they meet weekly and make a year-long commitment. Um, so the, the core member is, a vo is it's voluntary, by the way, just so you know. They don't have to do it if they don't want to. And often these things, beyond the year mark, they continue. So. Um, they, they meet as a team and then they also, many of them socialize outside of that. They maybe have dinner, they go grocery shopping, they give them practical help, um, or they recreate, take them hiking, fishing, and sort of model what normal pro-social recreation looks like. The, uh, they also can help provide housing assistance, meaning, uh, you know, help uh, accessing housing or employment. They sometimes do mock interviews or vouch for someone who um, is p uh, applying for a job. They can access substance abuse treatment. The reentry coordinator serves as kind of a case manager to help them navigate other social services. One of the things that I found that I was surprised about that I didn't expect is the ways that they help people adjust to being on the outside after a long term of incarceration. So some people are in f for 15 or 20 years and they have incredible sensory overload and they don't know how to go to the grocery store and have panic attacks. And uh, the team will take them in little small steps to buy a few things at a time or you know, just help them with that process. Um, and, and just as an aside, the core members all said that um, they felt like they would certainly have been back inside prison without the support of the COSA. Um, just because of the many different aspects of ordinary life that they really couldn't manage. The other thing that the COSA does is manage risk. So uh, because they're involved in their life and they get to know them, they see signs of risky behavior um, before a probation officer would. So in that way, they actually uh, can serve to prevent um, any kind of you know, uh, increased crime. So my uh, research stems from an evaluation that I did for DOC that, that spanned from 2010 to 2013. It was independent qualitative evaluation, and usually they want um, corrections departments or anybody wants quantitative, but what they really wanted to know was how they work, why they work, what is the nature of the relationships, because no one had studied that or documented it, and it was really important to know if you were going to try to replicate it to, to know what the important features are. So that's <laughs> really what I focused on and traveled around and interviewed people and met some many, many interesting people. So I interviewed 21 core members, 60% of whom were sex offenders, uh, 59 volunteers, and then nine of the local reentry coordinators. Um, that is obviously too small of a sample to generalize about recidivism. That's the next project. Uh, but out of that, there was only one person who had a new charge, and that was not a sex offense, um, and it wasn't a sex offender. And uh, so it, it's still, over a three-year period, that's still a smaller number than you would expect, but, um, but we can't make too much of it yet. 
So my challenge as a sociologist was, it is to try to make sense of the COSA model in terms of what we know about reoffending. So for many years, what criminologists have focused on is why do people commit crime? And the, the thinking was, if you understand why people commit crime, then you can develop programs to try to get them to stop. <laughs> Um, but the, recently, in about the last 10 years or so, there's a sort of a new exciting research that is called desistance, which looks at why do people desist? Because even people who are very committed to a criminal lifestyle, they have periods that they desist from crime, and they, there are moments of opportunity to intervene. So, the, for example, right when they get out of prison, they tend to be very motivated. Um, over time, if all they have is corrections pressing down on them and nothing helps helping to push them up or lift them up, then their motivation wanes. So those are what they call turning points that you can tap into. So the, but there are two different schools of thought about why people desist from crime. One focuses on the external things, like you age out of crime. Most people do age out of it. But while you're waiting for that to happen, uh, things like employment or marriage can have these kind of what I call stabilizing effects. Um, the other school of thought is, says that it's more important to focus on the internal factors, like what, what their motivation is, and then what are the identity shifts that need to happen for someone to begin to see themselves as a non-criminal. And, uh, you know, obviously those two things can be related in the sense that if you become committed to your employment, um, you, it may change your identity over time. Uh, but the, um, what I see as in the potential in ACOSA is that it, it moderates between those, it catalyzes both of those, and I'll explain why in a minute. But the way that it does it um, is through a process of civic engagement. So, um, and I'll try to explain a little bit by a way of a story. So one of my favorite stories is about a guy who was, his COSA told him he should do some community service. And he was not very happy about that. He didn't really want to do it. Um, but he was responsible for keeping a stoop clean or a, a street out in front of the area cleaned up. And um, I guess he was pretty resistant. But over time, people in the neighborhood that were walking by said how much they appreciated the work he was doing and how much value he was adding to the community. And then he began to take a lot of pride in this and began to interact with people, sort of ordinary people in the community, and, and began to feel like he was, you know, had a place at the table. So that really is a process of, you know, an external stabilizer. He had meaningful work, uh, even though it was community service. And it also helped to change his identity in terms of his his own um, you know, sense of himself. And it was through that process of community engagement and the potential to build social capital. So what we mean by social capital is the network of relationships that community, community members can draw upon to create healthy communities. And COSA does that. Um, and I think one of the things that's important to note about Vermont is that you know, Vermont is known for having a lot of social capital possibility um, at the community level, as Frank Bryan would talk about. And in part, that's because we have this um, very lively democracy. So um, many of the authors that focus on the internal aspects say that identity change is the most important part. And so one of the questions is, well, how do you facilitate this identity shift? Um, and what they say is that you have to have someone who believes in you and, uh, you know, who believes that you can be an asset to a community rather than a liability or that you have the potential to do good and as opposed to just the potential to do harm. And um, so Shad Maruna, who's the most famous person for talking about this, um, says that uh, what he found, he looked at people who had desisted permanently from crime to try to find out what it was about them. And he says that they all had a redemption script. And what he means by that is um, a retrospective story about their lives, which helps them maintain the idea that they were always fundamentally a good person but there were circumstances that waylaid them for a while, um, and now they're back on track to being the person that they were always meant to be. 
So, you know, one of the questions is, um, how does COSA help with that narrative reconstruction or that story? Um, he, Maruna also says that um, generativity is important, and really what that means is this optimism for the future or a sense that you can make a positive impact, and COSA can help facilitate those as well. And one of the things I found was that they do, um, even though I really wasn't looking for that. Um, so let me just give you some examples of the ways that um, COSAs I interact with, um, COSA teams interact with core members. So people on furlough in Vermont, you may not know, um, exist under some very intense conditions of release. And it's, they're, mo many times they're not allowed to drive, and yet they're supposed to have, they're supposed to be able to get to work and those kinds of things. So it, it can be really difficult depending on where you live. And um, one of the things that COSA team members do is drive them to their appointments sometimes. If they need a ride, they drive them to work, they drive them home, they may drive them to their probation office. So they add value in, in all kinds of ways because what they're doing is helping the core member stay within their conditions. They're not changing the conditions, they're helping them stay within it, but also manage to get the things that they need to do and the things that they want to do. Um, and what this ends up doing is creating a sense of gratitude and almost a disbelief that strangers would essentially do this. And that is the, the power, or what I call the moral authority, that the team actually ends up developing with the, the core member. So I'll just give you some quotes from this about that I think illustrate the identity change. I have um, reams and reams of quotes, so it's hard to choose the good ones because a lot of them say the same thing, but this will give you an idea of the kinds of things that people say. So one volunteer said, COSA are people who are going to not see him as who he was, but who are willing to help him manifest his best self and are going to be dedicated to it and who are not going to abandon him. And um, one of the things I should note is that a, a lot of the people, not all the people, but a lot of the people who are eligible for a COSA are very isolated and have um, no one, uh, that, or they have difficulty trusting people, and so it does take time to develop that, but one of the ways that that develops is by the team not giving up and not abandoning. The core member said, yeah, I'm changed and I feel better about myself. I feel more confident that I can do what I need to do and achieve. It's a lot because of the COSA, because before I was like, I'm just a nobody, nobody really cares about me, you know, forget it. But now I can actually truly see there's people out there that do care for me, and they care for me for who I am. And one of the things that I heard a couple times over and over again, um, volunteers would say, you, you shouldn't judge a person by the worst thing that they've ever done. And so um, they were willing to see the core member as you know, uh, more than just their crime. And if that sounds like they were minimizing it, they wouldn't. They, they, were, they were absolutely holding them accountable if they saw the person, uh, you know, showing signs of trying to minimize their crime. But they just wanted them to understand that there were whole other parts of them as well that were non-criminal. And that is what the research shows um, also. Another example that I think demonstrates social capital is a core member said, I can't stress the fact that they're not getting paid for this. You know what I'm saying? So they're just out of the kindness of their heart. They didn't know who I was. And now, even when I'm done with this, I've got their phone numbers and I can call them up anytime, even if it's just to talk at 10 o'clock at night if I'm having a rough time. So even after the year was over and all their commitments were done, and it's a pretty you know, substantial commitment, um, mo many of them stayed in touch and, and because they had a de developed a relationship that transcended it. And the other thing I should point out is that volunteers sign up over and over and over again because they say uh, it's so meaningful to them. Like, how, wh how, what other volunteer opportunities do you have where you can actually change somebody's life? You know? um, a volunteer said, Ultima ultimately, they're going to be coming out. They're going to become members of our community. Do we want to try and break that cycle someplace and turn them into constructive tax-paying um, members of society and people that we'd be proud to have for neighbors. So again, there's communicating the belief that they can be people that you would be proud to have your neighbors. And by virtue of that communication, um, the, the, that had a fairly powerful effect on people. So in thinking about how social capital formation leads to desistance, 
uh, my argument is that it really is the symbolic power of community <coughs> inclusion that by sh demonstrating to someone that they are a part of the community, that they are welcome in the community, um, and, and helping with both the mundane things like driving, going to the grocery store, uh, figuring out how to get a bus pass, how to, work the, how to work a cell phone. One person had been incarcerated before cell phones existed. They needed help learning how to use a cell phone. Just those kinds of mundane things, plus the profound things like spending time uh, doing recreational activities, those had enormous impact in terms of communicating a sense of belonging and inclusion. Um, and the other is that the, the context of support and accountability, one of the things I was very impressed by the volunteers was how well they understood how important that balance is. That, um, you know, that it's important to be supportive and that's how you get the, the moral authority to actually hold someone accountable. So if you're too long on one or the other, it might not work, but that, um, that it's a balancing act and that, that the accountability can really only happen within the context of a trusting relationship and, um, you know, powerful social bonds. So this may be a little academic for you, but this is my construction of what I consider restorative reintegration, and I think COSA is, um, demonstrates this. I'll try to explain. So um, when someone is released in the bottom left-hand corner, you see, um, you know, they're, they, if, they're, if you just open the door and release them, there's low levels of support and also low levels of community accountability. There's corrections keeping them accountable, but there's low levels of the kind of accountability that's going to make them feel necessarily a, a sense of obligation to their community. If you go high on accountability but low on support, you will, they will re-enter, and they may re-enter fairly successfully for a time, uh, or maybe forever, but they will not be truly integrated. Okay, so if it's high on support but low on ac accountability, then it's not restorative. And what I mean by that is the, the person may feel well integrated, but the community would not be, oh, I'm supposed to be clicking on those. The community would not be restored um, in the sense that they may not have this sense that they can hold the person accountable and that they can uh, feel safe and, you know, have the person repair the harm. Um, and if the community, you see that dotted line in the middle, if the community is heavily engaged and heavily invested in the, in the core member, then, then the offender can truly feel restored and, you know, as a member of of society, and uh, if you have both, then you have this, uh, you know, high levels of accountability and high levels of support, then the community is restored as well, as is the um, offender, and you have what is called um, restorative reintegration, and, and I think that um, COSA as a model adds to pieces to that that other kinds of reintegration may not do. Um, so I'll, just a couple more quotes, a reentry coordinator said to me, Core members were just like, wow, I can't believe you guys care. I mean, I've had two of them actually cry because they say to me, why do you and these volunteers want to help me after what I've done? And the volunteers would come back with, yes, you may have done that, but we see potential that you can have a successful life without reoffending." And a core member said, COSA was somebody that I can prove to that I can do good, that I will do good. And I mean, like, I wasn't rewarded for what I was doing, but it was just, I don't know, it felt good seeing somebody else smile because I was doing the right thing. And they constantly, I don't know, I guess that's how they reward me with the good jobs and the pats on the back and stuff, and it's nice. And I think this is an example of what Maruna meant by a redemption script. A core member said, I think they helped guide me on the path that I already knew that I wanted to take. I walked in and it was just like ordinary people. They're normal, everyday people. I feel I have connections that I didn't have before. And that's all from one quote. And I, I thought in that it summarized a lot of the different pieces of it. And one is that it's not professionals who are being paid to help them or paid to care about them. It's ordinary people who uh, really have no agenda for them except to make their own communities safer and to, to give someone a second chance. And it's funded by, this project was funded by the Second Chance Act, which is the federal money um, which is supposed to uh, do that sort of thing. So in conclusion, if I want to go back to talking about, you know, rather than this being just research in Vermont, it's research of Vermont. Um, I, I do not think that it's a coincidence that this program has been most successful in Vermont. And part of that is because of the fact that they do have this infrastructure, which was just a natural for them to 
um, to begin doing reentry, but also through that process of restorative uh, justice, they've created a culture where community members believe that they have um, an obligation to help people and that they have a stake in what happens in their community. Uh, so that culture is, sort of has this ripple effect um, to other people and, and reentry seemed like a natural for, for most people. Um, and I actually went out of turn, sorry. Back to the first point, um, isolation after incarceration is a risk factor for reoffending. And um, the role of the community has been really under theorized in the desistance literature. And um, it creates a tremendous possibility for trying to um, catalyze those external things and the internal th identity sorts of things. And it's also been underappreciated in correctional practice. And there's a lot of reasons why. Um, and I think Vermont should be applauded for, for taking that leap of faith and giving um, communities uh, enough authority and, you know, uh, credibility or yeah, credibility uh, to do community-based work. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to say what my next steps are since this is supposed to be research in progress. I, uh, Vermont has been doing these since 2006, the, the first one in the United States to do this. And at this point now, even though we're a small state, um, there's close to a hundred, uh, you know, completed circles of support. So now there's enough uh, that we can do a recidivism study that would uh, compare um, a group, you know, do a randomized trial, a match sample that would look at uh, people who didn't have a COSA compared with people who did have a COSA and look at it by offense type and all kinds of different things. And that is my summer project to do that. And I'm partnering with Robin Wilson, who is the person who did all the recidivism studies out of Canada. So we're both really excited about that. And it could have a huge impact in documenting um, you know, we just need more documentation that shows this work and then other states will start to um, do it. And, you know, the federal government is very, very interested in COSA as a model. And the other thing I've done with Derek Miodovnik, um, we developed a narrative change measurement, which is administered at time one and time two, kind of early on in the COSA process and then later, sort of asking how they see themselves. Do they, um, do they feel optimistic for the future? Do they have more non-criminal associates over time? Um, do they see themselves as a criminal? And uh, what we're doing is measuring the change over, um, over the course of the COSA from time one to time two. So stay tuned, that will be coming up also. So thank you. So questions, Is that, we should open it up to questions. Anyone, comments, questions? Yes. Um, who, what kind of offenders are eligible for this COSA? Well, it's supposed to be, so the interesting thing about Vermont, another interesting thing about Vermont is the only place in the world, as far as I know, that uses COSAs uh, for not just sex offenders, but other serious offenders. So it could be someone who uh, committed a murder, um, and it has been, um, you know, serious things resulting from uh, DUIs, um, robberies and things that were probably the result of drug, um, uh, drug problems, um, things like that. So there's a, a whole range of things, but they're very, very serious and, and or violent. Um, and I think, you know, of my sample, 60% were sex offenders, but of the total sample of, on this particular grant, it was about 50% were sex offenders. And, um, and, but in Canada, it's only sex offenders. In the UK, it's only sex offenders. Minnesota, New Zealand, um, and the Netherlands, so all over Europe. But in the United States, there's, um, there's uh, only a handful of places that are doing it at all. And, you know, Vermont said, well, there's nothing about this model that's particular to sex offenders. The only reason it was for sex offenders was because they tended to be the ones that were most ostracized and the most isolated and had the most difficulty reintegrating. So um, that's the main reason. Sarah. I don't know if you can answer this because it relates to your future work, but how are you going to match or randomize if you said that um, it was voluntary? Like, would that be a really key component? It, it would, that's one of the criticisms of the of the randomized trials that have happened because if you just take the people who volunteered 
and then you're, you're comparing them to people that didn't volunteer, there may be a real difference in motivational levels, right? The people who volunteered may be people who are very motivated. Um, one of the proposed ideas, we haven't quite worked it out yet, is um, to take people that are on the waiting list in Vermont because they have there's a lot of people that want in the program, and so there's enough people on the waiting list that would get, um, a, you know, that would want a COSA if they could. So that would maybe control for the motivational difference, but um, we we haven't gotten that far in the process yet. Yes. I was really interested in your narrative change measurement. Um, do you think that could translate to? Um, successes for restorative justice panels too in some way, especially as it um, for the um, offender, as the offender um, you mean the, the idea of narrative change? Um, sure, I think um, the, you know I think one of the reasons that COSA is really prime for that is because it's such a long commitment, it's such a long relationship that um, if you had a, a one-time meeting, I mean, not to say that they aren't profound in terms of you know changing people's behavior because restorative justice has been shown to be, but um, you know I, I don't know how long you'd have to be meeting to see a true narrative change. I think one of the things that is nice about restorative justice as we do it in Vermont um, is, as kind of a diversion scheme is that hopefully they won't develop a criminal identity in the first place, right? So um, that's, you know, I think having it at all levels throughout the criminal justice system is is ideal and it's certainly where we need to go next. Um, you know, corrections, corrections can only do so much, right? Anyone else? Richard. So there are some students here in our Vermont Studies course, and I'm wondering if there's something about Vermont that this system works in a way because there's some volunteers, right? Right. And is that something about Vermont that there's more people who are, who are interested and engaged and willing to volunteer? And do they, are there young people who are getting involved in some of these circles of support of the community justice or? Are there young people? Is that what you say? Um, well, uh, to answer your first question, I think, um, well, just to back up a little bit, there's a, a book called The Politics of Imprisonment by Vanessa Barker, where she talks about states that have gone a very punitive route and compared them to states that have not, that have come up with alternatives. And one of the things she says that the states that have not um, uh, have in common is they have a less centralized government um, which, of course, I think the community justice infrastructure shows, I mean, it is still part of a municipality, but it, you know, it, it is uh, somewhat decentralized in terms of control, um, and also have very active uh, democracies. So I think when you think about town meeting and the, you know, uh, the, the history of participatory democracy in Vermont, um, I think that that makes a difference in terms of people becoming engaged in their communities. And maybe it is something to do with the scale also, the, the size of the communities. Um, but, uh, and I don't, I don't know how they find volunteers. I don't know how that, how that happens, you know. But, um, the second question about whether young people are involved, I mean, certainly a lot of COSAs are um, heavy on, um, you know, people who, have, or who are retired because they're the ones that often have the time um, to devote. And I think that, you know, a lot of times what they try to do is a mix of ages. So they might have a college student. There are plenty of college students that do it. And in, and in fact, New Zealand, they use, um, almost all college students, they, they partner with universities and do that. Um, and, and that's only with sex offenders, so that's you know, sort of an interesting model. But I think when you do have a mix of ages, it, it bring, they bring something different to the table. And so you know, older people, uh, some, some people are, you know, want a sort of parenting figure or um, uh, a, you know, a wise elder. And, uh, and then I'm thinking of an example where there was a younger people and there was, it was a young guy who got out and he wanted to play basketball and he played basketball with you know, one of his team members and that was that added value but there's um, so yeah I mean there there's certainly um, room for young people and it's definitely been done um, that's what they do in Minnesota also they use college students for it yes so from a psychological perspective often people who 
where sex offenders, and depending on what kind of sex offenders, are labeled as very difficult to treat, right, and, and very likely to reoffend. And here I find that because of the sociology, you're, you're, you're looking at things in a much um, more inclusive and wider way and finding maybe some differences. And it may be too early to generalize, but just wondering about your insights about that because one of my thoughts have always been that part of the reason it was so hard to treat sex offenders is this isolation because how can you heal when you are so separate from society? But I don't know. Well, I mean, I guess if you think about um, any type of offending, you, you know, there, there are different moments where people will feel vulnerable to that offending and where they feel um, you know more able to resist or where they're more tempted or they have more motivation um, and uh, you know uh, the desistance literature says a lot of that is structural so you know if you feel hopeless because you can't get a job and you can't live within the city limits and you can't you know you can't do this that and the other thing you can't go to church you can barely go out in public you know um, you know that certainly we think that's helping things but it, it, it that's a motivation killer you know and so I think that um, one of the the value you have to provide some sort of positive um, something for people to look forward to give them a, you know a reason to to uh, not commit a crime. So I think the isolation is a huge part of it. But, um, you know, these are not people who are, have been untreated. They've been treated um, inside. And um, most, if not all, I mean, Andy, you can tell me, are still receiving treatment on, you know, out in, in the community. So they're still connected to treatment. Um, it, it, the, the COSA team is not uh, supposed to take over as their treatment team you know uh, they provide uh, just uh, you know the ordinary human support that every person needs if you think about the hierarchy of needs it's sort of a basic human rights uh, or human need issue I think I don't know if that answers your question but I mean I think you know one of the things I would say about corrections in, in general in the United States is that it went from a very extreme psychological view that that you know all you had to do was treat the psychological problems and then they'd be fine um, and that was probably a reaction to the extreme sociological view in the 60s that thought there was never anything wrong with anybody we they just needed jobs and you know education and so now it's kind of in between realizing that it's both and then also looking outside those and saying well what about how you live your life in a neighborhood you know what that's just it seems so simple but uh, nobody ever really thought about that before they, you know, so they weren't surprised when they came back to prison. You know. Yep. One thing that comes to mind when you talk about how well the Vermont Department of Corrections system matches this model is what happens to those who uh, are in corrections out of state and then come back? Um, Have you seen any differences? Um, I'm, I, you know, I... Um, in my interviews, they were specifically about their reentry needs, and I didn't. Some people volunteered that they had been out of state, but I certainly don't know, um, you know, how much of an impact that was. I mean, that certainly, I, I could see how you'd come back with more deficits than if you were in state. Um, but the, uh, I think the larger study that we do, we can certainly look at you know how many went out of state and how many didn't and see if there is any kind of difference but there you know there's so many different factors that go into who ends up going out of state in the first place um, you know that they're not necessarily the same people as the people that stay in state oh sorry no that's okay um, one of the things you didn't touch on that I wondered about as, as a COSA member is with sex offenders in particular is culturally they Family structures where there's a lot of secretive secrets, mm -hmm. and one of the common features of the COSA is that there are no more secrets. Right. Everything is told to everybody. Right. And I'm wondering if that cultural change has any effect on the outcomes. Hmm. Um. You mean learning to th that the no secret? I'm. Um, you know. Not keep secrets. Um, I don't know. That's an interesting thing to look at. I haven't really looked at that, but I w I'm glad you brought it up. Only because I mean, mostly because of the fact that um, 
the team approach, one of the things I found is that it's very effective in that respect. So one of the things that people would worry about is that, um, you know, community members could be sort of taken in by someone who's being manipulative or they would collude with them or that kind of thing. And the team approach seems to really keep uh, the boundaries in check and they, the fact that the core member knows that the team will, sh you know, not keep its secrets and will also share as needed things with the probation officer um, so that they're, um, you know, there's, there's no sense that they're going to be able to get away with something and, you know, so I do think that maybe there is a sort of socialization process that they learn that this is different. It's kind of like there's more eyes in the community, but they're kind eyes, you know, that's the way I think of it is like kinder eyes or maybe it's, it's a net of social control, but it's a very soft net, you know, um, a, a much kinder net. Um, so they, they still generally have a very positive reaction, you know, to the, even that. I mean, uh, you know, uh, not that everybody loves being held accountable all the time. I mean, none of us, none of us does, right? So. Oh, yes. So does the COSA volunteer receive any kind of like guidance or training before they go and have to provide the support to these convicted criminals? Yes. I, I'm glad you asked that. Um, yeah. Do they receive any training? Yes. And um, the training has evolved quite a bit. Um, Corrections puts it on. Um, and uh, with the community justice directors and reentry coordinators, um, at this point, it's 10 hours of, of training. And, but one of the things that I found was that the reentry coordinator serves a really important function in providing sort of ongoing ad hoc training as things come up, because issues will come up, and if a team doesn't know how to deal with it. And that person, the reentry coordinator doesn't just set them up and let them go. They stay very, very close to what's going on. And they're, and they're highly skilled in, um, in knowing the conditions of release, what are the kinds of behaviors that are problematic. So um, I, I would say that they get training, as much training as they want all along the way, pretty much. But yes, they wouldn't turn you loose until you um, knew. And there's a lot of rules. You have to sign a contract about you know certain boundaries that you have to have and things like that. Yes? One of the risk factors for a large percentage of, of uh, core members is drug and alcohol relapse. Mm -hmm. um, is there any studying being done about whether or not COSA or how COSA helps to prevent that? Um, you know, the, it's interesting that you should say that because all the co other COSAs around the world and the country are only for sex offenders who may have drug and alcohol issues underlying, um, you know, and, and but um, since Vermont's the only one that takes people who that maybe that's their primary um, issue, um, I think you know, the, I mean, they do provide access to treatment um, if they need it. Um, but I, you know, I haven't looked at that specifically, but one thing that um, a couple of core members told me that they had discovered was by hanging out with their team, going fishing or um, doing whatever, they sort of learned other ways to have fun that don't involve drugs and alcohol, which is kind of the model of having, you know, an AA sponsor or an NA sponsor, similar sort of thing. Um, and so it, it can function in that way, I think, as well. Yes, Molly. Um, do you think that there is room for COSA to be, to be applied to, like, lesser crimes? Um, well, yes. There's no reason why it wouldn't work anybody who needed or wanted support. Um, but volunteers are a precious commodity, and so I think that uh, because there, there aren't, uh, you know, lines and lines of people, you know, waiting to, to do it, um, they have to use them for the people that really are, you know, are likely to not succeed without that sort of support. But that said, there's no reason why it couldn't be expanded. In fact, I, you know, if I were a queen, um, and I, that's what I would do, every person coming out of jail would get a COSA but uh, or some form of it but uh, you know it's not it's not really feasible in terms of management I mean not that they're that expensive to run um, really um, compared to the alternative but they um, they are labor intensive but, yeah um, how often did you find COSA volunteers wrestling with whether or not to pass information to a probation uh, parole officer or something like that? Um, 
you know, I, I'm sure that those things happen sometimes. Um, I think that, uh, um, you know, because it was a team approach, I think there, you know, there were times where um, I, I heard about where a core member would try to try to just tell a secret to this one person and say this is just between you and me because we are a little bit closer and then the team member would say no 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 that's not the way this works you know this is a team approach this is you know um they they would sometimes say i'm going to have to tell your probation officer so why don't you tell your probation officer first and then they would and that would help that relationship um the probation office, the relationship with the probation officer was better because of the fact that they came forward. So they, um, you know, and then sometimes probation officers then would see a lot of value in the in the COSA team because they could, you know, sort of hold them accountable at this level and and get things reported that wouldn't have otherwise. But I didn't. Um, I mean, I'm not saying that that never happened, but it didn't. Uh, it didn't come up as as an issue. advantages are of using the core team strategy or like multiple people as opposed to like a one-on-one -on -one mentoring system well I think the the team I'm sorry oh the question yeah she asked what you, you were asking about the team approach why that's better than a a one-on-one -on -one mentor well I, you know I think a one-on-one -on -one mentor is less volunteer intensive right so there are some benefits to that model that you could just use one person I think if they're developing a, a dyad relationship, you you know all the concerns that people have about um, you know ba maintaining boundaries and um, you know maybe focusing too heavy on the support and not as heavy on the accountability. I think you know it, it seems like it, that would be more likely to happen because um, you know you'd have kind of a, a team dynamic that would emerge where one person would be sort of the good cop and then somebody else would develop the bad cop you know um, and, and I don't it's not they're not really cops but you know what I mean um, you know that, that, that because they were kind of trying to balance it and that dynamic would emerge and and um, and I felt like that the the team really benefited from each other's perspectives and they talked about it a lot that way um so i think that you know even though it's intensive in terms of volunteers it it it, it serves such an important function i think in terms of just the accountability piece that i think it's worthwhile but um but i could see a coast of light you know for less serious things uh maybe but i don't know I'm just, so one or two more, and then I'm sure Kathy's around if people just want to come up and sure. talk to you. Many of you are involved in all this work, so feel free to, I don't know, throw out your own thoughts on this. Some are. I recognize some, some community justice folks. Yes? I'm wondering what, like, the demographics are in terms of gender of core members, if you see more men or more women. Uh, way more men, um, and, and in fact, you know, out of Canada, I don't know if they're all men, but uh, they're virtually. I mean, because they're doing high-risk sex offenders, those tend to be men. Not that they're never women, but um, for the most part, um, and uh, there's there's only a couple women in my sample, and um, uh, I, you know. It's because, I mean, statistically, the more serious offenses are, are committed by men. I guess that's probably why. Maybe women have more social supports also. I'm not sure. but Yes, sir. Does the uh, COSA team meet without the core member often? Um, they debrief kind of before and after sometimes, and I think they check in a lot by phone or um, and they sit down with the reentry coordinator and sort of talk about how things go. The other thing, they do cross check stories too, um, you know, outside and to make sure that, um, you know, again, the accountability piece to, to make sure that there's nothing sketchy going on. So one of the things that I think people, um, you know, might, think when they first hear about ACOSA is that it's risky you're letting these people in communities and they're hanging out with community members but they're in communities anyway they're already there right um, and uh, they're actually having you know m more people who are you know 
looking out for them. So it, it is a community safety model primarily, and I, I, you know, I think there's lots of evidence to show that it actually prevents crime, um, in part because of the the way that volunteers function and the relationship, the clear relationship to corrections. And I, I do want to say also that some of the other states um, and places, even like in New Zealand, have you know might feel that it's not ideal for corrections to run this. They really need a different entity to run it because of what, you know, corrections does compliance. That's what they, you know, um, they do control. They're, you know, and even if a probation officer might like to do the more social work components, they, they have a caseload that can't really do it. And it's difficult for a probation officer to do kind of both of those. And um, so this, this provides, you know, and they're not probation officers, but it provides a different thing that I think um, can help people, um, you know, remain safer in the community. So maybe that's a good place to stop. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to the commissioner and thank you, Dr. Thank you. Fox, for